Hi everyone. This is the start of this series of mini lectures for module one, which is about Chinese and Korean art since 1279. And this module is going to last two weeks. So when you look through the readings and resources page, if you think, oh, this is a lot, keep in mind that this module covers two weeks. And I suggest that you um, don't wait until the last minute to tackle this, but don't worry if it takes you a few days to work through this material. Um, we're going to think about things like the development of porcelain. We're going to think about um, more contemporary artists um, and their critique of the Chinese state and politics in the 21st century. And here I'm just repeating the objectives from um, that you have already looked at for this module. So at the end, you need to be able to identify major monuments of Chinese and Korean art after 1279, assess this relationship between art and politics, evaluate the relationship between national identity and art and here we can think about the question what does the label Chinese art or what does the label Korean art mean and then finally you need to be able to identify and analyze methods of artistic transmission in Chinese uh, in China and Korea since 1279 all right we're going to start with a map of the Silk Roads and the Silk roads we really should think plural here um, these this is a vast network of different routes overland routes that connect east and west asia and then from west asia we can think about that extending into the mediterranean and europe and north africa the silk roads have a long history they begin under the han dynasty in the second century bce and merchants traveled along it bringing goods in both directions and also um, their own belief systems as well things like buddhism and their ideas about visual culture architecture the silk routes are really important when we think about um when we think about the art and architecture of east asia what we're looking at here is the first dynasty in China that we're going to consider in this time period, the Yuan Dynasty. And what happens, we see a big shift in 1279. Um, Mongol tribes invade northern China from Central Asia under the Genghis Khan. You've probably heard of Genghis Khan before. And what happens is we see generations of Mongol invasions, and in 1279, Genghis's grandson Kublai Khan expands the Mongolian Empire and declares himself Emperor of China as well. Now, again, to make another kind of global connection here, Marco Polo spent 17 years in the court of Kublai Khan, and he writes in his own um, in his own work about the intellectual and artistic endeavors of the court. The new um, Yuan dynasty, they established their capital in what is now uh, Beijing in northern China. And um, they were, you know, it's, this is a new kind of invading uh, force here. And so all the kind of Chinese cultural elite they are, um, there's a lot of tension here with the political court, with the new, uh, with these new foreign rulers. And we're going to talk about um, this kind of tension and how different artists and intellectuals express their displeasure with their government. Um, we're going to focus on the literati. And the literati are an educated um, a group of educated artists and writers who worked at the court for centuries um, in China. Uh, even the emperor himself participated in calligraphy, poetry, and painting. These art forms are inextricably intertwined in Chinese art. Um, they are not seen as separate endeavors but something these are things to be um, considered together and to master um, to master together and what happens when the mongolians come to power in the yuan dynasty is there's a dis increasing distinction between the art of this literati the kind of elite scholarly class 
and then the court painters who got commissions from specific members of the royal court. The literati had always produced art as civil servants, and so they're not necessarily working on these individual commissions. But of course, the literati were no longer, um, they were kind of forced out of the Yuan dynasty government, and often um, they they left, um, retreated from society in general and kind of expressed their um, their disgruntled feelings in their art. And that's what we're going to look at here in a second. But I want to bring up another important concept for us, and that's du hua, or to read a painting. And du hua really connects to this notion of um, the three perfections in a single work of art. So, so a, a, a Yuan work of art, a literati work of art is thinking of, is incorporating elements of calligraphy, poetry, and painting. That these, that these mediums do not exist independently of each other. All right, let's look at an example here of a literati work that um, that expresses Du Hua. This is Zhao Mengfu's Groom and Horse from the early decades of the Yuan Dynasty. And this is what is known as a hand scroll. We'll go back to the painting in a second, but here you can see a kind of diagram of what, of the major components of a hand scroll. It's an ink and water-based, um, um, ink and water-based colors on paper. That also generally includes the seals of the maker, and then any um, any future owner also includes his inscription, and it's usually a his. And so this history of ownership here is what's known as the colophon. And so there's it's not just the kind of singular work of art, but it's also who has owned this. Sometimes you see added commentary later from these uh, future owners. And so there's a real kind of, um, you know, really kind of understanding these hand scrolls as a kind of living work of art. And we can think about these, all of these subsequent generations of owners as reading this Chinese painting, entering into a dialogue of the past, uh, with the past. And so we can find that, you know, a hand scroll too, you're also physically handling the work of art. You are unrolling that scroll. We're also going to see albums too. So you're, you know, paging through the album. There's a physical connection here, an intimate experience that has been shared and repeated over the centuries. Um, Zhao Meng Fu is a retired member of the literati, and um, he turned to express his beliefs, his kind of, and we're going to see his kind of disgruntled beliefs, in an indirect way. Um, he had been one of the leading calligraphers of his time, and we see him depicting here in the center a groom and his horse. And the horse has been valued in Chinese culture for many generations, um, is treasured by emperors and warriors. It was the favorite subject by leading Chinese uh, literati paintings, uh, painters for centuries. And it might be hard to kind of read the political subtext here, but we can see this portrait of a horse and groom may be read as an admonition to those in power. So a kind of subtle message to these Mongol rulers to heed the abilities of those in their command and to conscientiously employ their talents in the governance of the people. So the idea of the groom who is kind of harnessing the ability, the power, the talents of the horse. And this is something that, you know, Zhao Meng Fu felt neglected. He, um, he felt like his scholarly talents were being, um, were being overlooked by these new rulers. We also see here another work by Zhao Meng Fu, uh, Twin Pines Level Distance. And this is again another hand scroll. We can see it completely unfurled here. So you can see these red stamps here though that makes up the colophon so the history of ownership we can see part of the inscription here but then we also have the landscape with a bit of uh, poetry done in traditional calligraphy and 
this builds on the tradition of Northern Song Dynasty landscape painting. Think about Fan Quan's travelers amongst uh, the mountains and streams from the 11th century. And I know in your small group discussions, you're going to talk about your prior knowledge of Chinese art. I hope you talk about the importance of landscape painting and how landscape painting has had a history um, that connects to Taoism, D-A-O-I-S-M. Taoism is a kind of Chinese um, cultural religious practice. Tao means path or way. And it's a tradition that emphasizes living in harmony with the Tao. And um, ergo, living in harmony with nature. And so we feel like in these landscapes, it's as if we can just kind of wander through. It's not a kind of cohesive whole, but there's bits of intrigue. We kind of meander, um, not in a straightforward path to interact with these works. There's also a level of um, Confucian ideas being expressed here as well. Confucianism is the ethical and philosophical system that developed from the teachings of the Chinese philosopher Confucius. He lived, um, let's see, quick math here in my head, he lived 1800 years before this painting was um, uh, created, but Confucianism was adopted by the Han Dynasty and it emphasizes this idea of social order. And so we often see this kind of back and forth between the meandering, the Tao, um, the Taoist philosophy here, but then also finding the, um, the kind of order underneath um, that represents Confucianism. Landscape paintings by the Chinese literati do not need to record specific sites. The goal was to record a kind of essence, a kind of tree-ness or a mountain-ness. Uh, the, here we can think about the quote, nature is vast and deep, high intelligence is infinite and eternal. Okay, I see I'm kind of bumping up, I'm kind of um, getting close to here, um, cutting, uh, ending here this first of several mini lectures, but um, I want to point out a few more um, key, um, key elements here of the form that if we look at the, um, you know, if we look at the rocks and the trees, we can see this characteristic calligraphic brushwork that gives us this sense of life energy. Um, and the colophon here, this inscription on the left, also expresses the artist's views on painting. This is Zhao uh, Mengfu's own words, and he said he talks about how he studied calligraphy and landscape painting, and he mentions a few artists, a ch past Chinese artists who really influenced him. Um, some of the Tang Dynasty masters, such as um, Wang Wei, but then he also mentions the Northern Song painter Fan Quan. Um, Dong Yuan. And so he is situating himself in this kind of lineage of the great Chinese landscape painters. The pine tree is also significant here because think about pine trees. They don't, um, they don't lose their leaves. They remain green through the winter. They're a symbol of survival. And here I think we can read a little bit into this notion of survival that Zhao, he has, um, you know, he has endured insults from the government. Um, he withdraws from government service because he feels like his talents aren't being used. And so I think there's a bit of kind of identifying with the pine, this feeling of persevering and, um, and this idea that the pine signifies the moral character of a virtuous man.